Jamie, happy to have you on the show. How are you doing today? Wonderful, <coughs> really good. Um, in Changu for the day, back to back. Excited to be here. I'm excited to have this interview. You've been a friend of mine for some time now. And um, we are hosting this interview in Tropical Nomad, which is a co-working space in Bali. Shout out to you, Ichi. Thank you for allowing me to use your space always. Um, you actually were there for the very first episode that I conducted here in uh, Tropical mm. Nomad in, in Bali. And there were only a couple of people in the audience, but we made friends immediately after. And that meant so much to me that you showed up there for me. So it will be an honor of mine to uh, learn a little bit of how you became such a great guy. Jamie, introduce yourself. It's I know a bunch of things about you, but you're always involved in so many different things. I feel like uh, it would be a good opportunity to tell the world who you are. Who am I? Um, Without going too philosophical. <laughs> Jamie's a serial entrepreneur, founder and CEO of the company, been there, among some other things, and one of the best people I ever met. So if people ask you what you do, how do you introduce yourself usually? How do you encapsulate yourself? I would say that I am very energetic. I love to be around people. Uh, I get my energy from people and I love making connections and especially when I see uh, others and this is something that in my life and, and actually comes from my dad, but his motto in life was a, a stranger is a friend you haven't met yet. Mm. And so I very much have kind of lived with that on my, on my sleeve and gone out into the world and see every opportunity to be that almost weird guy in the coffee shop who talks to that stranger to yeah. say hello, to make a small joke, to uh, don't mind being that, that weird guy who ultimately creates a connection and sort of breaks the, the norm. And I, 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 I love to, to create those connections with people. So um, for me, people and connecting people and uh, finding like the gems of individuals like yourself, is a very special thing for me and how I sort of go and approach my life. One of my goals personally uh, was to become a master of the strange when I left Germany in a way. I had this idea that my life wasn't really going well, that I'm always one person away from figuring my shit out, so to say in a way. And I feel you are the same in this regard where you always have this pro-human attitude about yourself, but you love meeting people, but you love humans in general. And I was curious, uh, if there was ever a situation where you feel early in the first chapter of your life where you feel this uh, made you pro-humanity rather than against that. I think one time that really stands out was actually when I individually went traveling for the first time in my life. So I was 19 and I... Well, actually, there was, a, there was a time in America when I, um, I went traveling. I, I went and was a wakeboard instructor at a summer camp in America looking after uh, kids uh, at a, a kids camp. And it was uh, in New Hampshire, at Lake Winnipesaukee, it's called, the, the lake in, in Camp Winoki. And I was basically just a, a big kid. But in that moment and in being there by myself, I realized the power of actually meeting individuals who are... Nothing like you, but exactly like you. Mm. And so they have the same vision. They have this same belief system. And it um, excites you to actually get the most out of you as an individual. And I think that has helped me. Um, and, and from that moment in America, and I went traveling afterwards, that sort of shaped me to realize that I actually hold some value. People like me. And that's quite an exciting, fulfilling feeling when you're like, ah, I can, I can be around people and people see me as, as someone who is an individual who they like to hang out with and get excitement from and create adventures and stories together. Yeah. And that led me to start to travel by myself and come to Southeast Asia and like other moments of, I remember um, I arrived in Southeast Asia the year after I went uh, oh, two years after, actually. Um, and I was going from Bangkok all the way to Chiang Mai, and I was sat on a train. 
And I just had a few crazy days in Bangkok and I was like, wow, this is so amazing. All I had to say, go in a hostel bar and be like, hey, look at someone, go, hey, how's it going? And they respond and say, yes, I'm great. How are you? And you're like, do you want to grab a beer? And then boom, you, you're friends. And it's yeah. simple as that, as creating that connection. Yeah. We had a crazy, beautiful time. And I remember going up to Chiang Mai. I put my legs out of the train and I'm like, this is crazy. I see all these paddy fields and cows and and this is so different to the world that i've been brought up in england and i was like there's no, almost like it feels like there's no rules here but there are rules and it's structured and i put my uh, headphones in stuck my legs out of the of, of the train and i put my favorite song on which is um uh, lovebirds want you in my soul and i just started crying like out of pure joy it was yeah. like the most beautiful moment of i think my uh, teen, like uh, coming in my in my adolescence, and becoming my own individual person, hmm. and I think there's something so powerful in that. And so I'd say that was uh, a, a moment where I was like, "Wow, I I can create so much value in the people I'm surrounded by, and I'm like an individual, and this is just the start." And hmm. I remember feeling with that joy and that like uh, goosebumps that it gave me wow, my life is about to change. Um, so I think that as a moment is, is very strong to me. I love that about you. I love that you are, I think one of the things that I learned from you is that in order to be interesting, you need to be interested. And there's something transformative about curiosity when you have an open heart and go to the world like that. I feel people, they crave that themselves. I think like it re requires a lot of courage actually to just to simply, hey, how are you doing? You want to grab a beer? It's sometimes you, that person has never been asked that question in a way. And I think we all need some more friends. Um, tell me, however, how you grew up. It's like one of the things that I would like to learn about you in this, in this interview is your personal journey of becoming early mentors you have. We, I think I'm going to put this in the show notes as well. You have this wonderful platform that you're currently building where you uh, connect students or scholars who want to learn a particular skill with knowledge merchants who have acquired a particular form of wisdom that is useful to the world and you are helping them to um, monetize that and help that to help more people with this. So let's investigate for a second where it all started. What do you think was one of the first memories of yours that carried your signature in regards to it? This was Jamie. Yeah? Does that question make sense or was it yeah. too loud? Okay. I have always been a little bit silly, uh, a little bit naughty, always seeing how far I could push things to then getting in trouble that then I would understand and was intelligent, I guess, enough to understand the situation and then pull back. Um, so always pushing the boundaries, always... Um, just getting up to, to no good in terms of like arriving on a campsite and then like running off with my brother to um, to investigate an adventure and see what things we could find and what uh, walk past rooms and try every door to see that maybe it would open up into a kitchen and then we would like go through the kitchen or whatever that would be to find out uh, and discover this adventure. How to climb on this roof when we look at, at this roof and go how can we get up there? And then we're trying to figure out and then uh -huh. we find out how to get there. So I think that's Interesting. collectively as, as memories of being younger, um, breaking through the fence to get into the woods, getting on top of the fence to jump over to um, always, and, and me, my, I have a younger brother who's three years younger and one of my friends, my best friend who I've uh, known all my life, Adam, he and I and his brother um, would always be a gang and always like up to things, making dens, building trees, f climbing trees, tree houses. That was a very early... A gang? A troublemaker. I love that, that you just described that your venture is called Been There hmm. and that there was this curiosity within you where you... You found a particular challenge, overcome it, and then use those exact same words. 
I feel that an expert is also somebody who made all the mistakes in the book <laughs> and survived them somehow. What was the moment where you really got in trouble in the very first epochs of your life? And survived it, hopefully. <laughs> yeah, I remember actually being at school. Um, and I was, I, like I said, I always managed to be naughty but intelligent and up to the line. And then one time I remember at school, I must have been maybe 13, something like this, 14. And I... Um, I guess I went too far and I got put on this, um, it's like a scorecard where each class you go to, you have to take the scorecard and each teacher now gives you, it's almost like your own review because like, yeah. you've been so naughty. You haven't been kicked out of the school, but you're like on probation of like, watch out, this could happen if yeah. you continue. Um, and I remember my parents being so disappointed because they uh, brought me up to... Um, to be to do the the right thing and i was very almost disappointed in myself yeah in that moment and i remember being like i'm gonna show them i'm gonna show their my parents my teachers that actually i might be on the scorecard but everyone uh who grades me is gonna be like wow like he's getting the top marks top top like uh, effort and uh, engagement and all of these things. So I kind of like tried to like flip it into yeah. showing them that actually I was the perfect student. Mm. And so that I, th uh, I remember was a, was a moment. I think it came from like, ah, within like, ah, I can actually show people what I can provide and what I can do. Um, and I am a good guy. I'm not, a, I'm a, I'm not one of these naughty, uh, people who has no future, you know? Mm. I found that some of the greatest people I ever met were not only shaped by positive experiences, but by tragic or challenging things that occurred within the first chapters of their life where they they grew strong because of the weakness of others or they grew strong because of a particular nexus moment that shaped them into who they later became. Looking back at the first chapters of your life, what was your nexus moment? I think it's a great question, and I think I'm very lucky in the fact that I I haven't really had many, and uh, it's only later in my life that I've had these these times. But growing up, I had a great uh, family parents I admire them so much we were very supportive I I never really had any bad traumatic moments I remember thinking recently like oh yeah maybe therapy could be really good and then after three sessions and I was just like ah I just there's nothing I, and yeah. I remember like uh, uh, stopping very quickly after and and feeling like I Meant not, didn't necessarily have any traumatic experience like what you're talking about later in life for sure um, but nothing that maybe shaped me sometimes a nexus moment can also it doesn't have to be Batman losing his parents a nexus moment can also be a particularly overcharged moment with meaning in which you learn something or which you mm. set your mind on something because you're extraordinary Jamie and <laughs> it's it's and it's, sometimes I'm looking for the initiation for that particular journey because it's for those people who don't know Jamie. Jamie is, is, is I met him when you had the, the noble mission of providing every individual in the world with a mentor, you know, and that's something I feel I sneak my way into doing this in this very conversational way, where I learned that through my podcast, through my academic ventures, or even my latest AI ventures, that I put myself in the company of great people and I felt some years ago particularly when I was uh, my life wasn't going well that if I would just learn from enough wonderful people who had their shit figured out that I would uh, potentially have a great learn how to live so to say what was it for you that set you on this uh, extreme educational journey that is uh, so directed towards learning and so directed towards teaching and contributing into other people's lives. Mm. 
so I'll get to that question, I think, a uh, second of um, what made me pursue uh, probably more risk. And I saw that as, as adventure and the more experiences that you have in your life, the more cuts that you have, but the more learning you, you have. So I think that's second. But I think when we go back to the question just before and you made me realize that I used to play football uh, at a, at a young age and, and uh, when I was playing uh, at Newcastle uh, in their development I uh, was very good in my local area and because I got to a level which was, was a, a high level but it also made me realize that the amount of other competition and people out there who are also extremely talented and so it quickly dawned on me which was a sad and I think the most pivotal in terms of disappointment that I had as an early teenager, 15, 16, I think, when I left Newcastle. Um, I was like, I'm not going to become the professional footballer that I thought I was going to be. Hmm. So there was like, everything I did was gearing up to be this professional footballer. My parents are super supportive with the teams. I moved even when like my dad was the manager at one of my football clubs. And I moved to a better team to help further develop me as a footballer. But it quite quickly made me realize that I was not going to get there because there's just the funnel and the amount of people. That, I mean, the higher you get, you realize the quality is so different. So that was something I had to deal with. And I think at that moment, I was quite sad. And then I actually started making money online uh, through business and and that kind of shifted my attention to like, oh, may, there's something else I have to do with my life because I can't mm. play football. <laughs> mm. Yeah, that speaks to me a lot. Like that's, I spent almost the, the first from 15 to 25, like obsessively trying to become a basketball player in a way. And I feel uh, the greatest thing that ever happened to me was not becoming a basketball player because I feel it's it would have been the, the death of all my of me living like a nomadic schooler in mm. a way because it requires so much monodimensional thinking almost in a way yeah. um and and just uh, just before you move on about the second part of that question and and yes please how please I, thank you how, how i then went and i i think because like I admire my, my dad and my mom for being so supportive and so encouraging and not only encouraging but facilitating me to continue to go to all these clubs and um, my dad waking up at 5.30, traveling down to London, which is three and a half hours, going on a full day's work with um, a, a huge company and running that and then to dry, get on a train three hours home, arrive home at 10 p.m. and sitting down with me to do my chemistry homework or my maths homework for two hours until I really got it and then going to sleep and then doing the same the next day mm. and s still doing my homework. And so I admired that, that push and that, that desire to, to do that. I remember c sometimes going out in the morning and uh, if my dad was working from home, he would be like, look at my shoes and be like, you need to polish them. And so he would like come and be like, you're not going to school like that. And he would like want us to present ourselves and to be this... Um, the certain way, um, but it was just all to help give us mm. better opportunity and to, 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 to teach us lessons. And I think that early um, support give me a way to go, I know I can always be okay if, I, let me go take some risks in my life. Let me go and push the boundaries of what's possible and what I think is possible. And the worst case, I can always come back because it's pretty nice here. It's pretty good. And so that support network that a parent can provide anyone, I think is so um, so, so encouraging. And that's probably what pushed me to make these risks. And I think then I went out into the world and I started traveling and I started seeing, and I was like, well, he sat at a computer on his, uh, sorry, yeah. in a cafe on his computer. And I'm like, well, if he can do it, I can do it. Mm. Like what is stopping him? And there was like this click of like, well, I want to go out there, learn, do these crazy things, adventures. And I know I, I'm only going to learn and, and try them. So that was like very exciting for me. And then I say all of this, but it's funny because then I have my brother and he's really not like this. So he's very, a lot more risk averse. 
So it's interesting that even from yeah. the same parents and same bringing up, that not everyone is the same. So then it comes down to, well, maybe that's just more innately yeah. me, actually. Yeah, interesting. It's, uh, it reminds me of, I don't think, I once had a thought, I said, even siblings don't have the same father. In a way, it's, it's something, I think we still have unique experiences with our our parents where there's, uh, they don't treat siblings the same way. So like everybody has their unique experience, so to say, but staying at your dad for for a while. You founded this platform, which is, I feel like a very masculine platform in its essence, because I think like one of the things that our society has lost is these, these rites of passage where there comes a man into your life and he helps you to figure how to get to where you want to be in your life. What was, you think, uh, a situation between you and your father that describes the relationship or the dynamics between the two of you? Now or back then? Back then. I mean, I see now, if I look back, um, and I see him being my almost, like, biggest... Um, cheerleader when it comes to like facilitating me to become the best version of me um, I didn't see it at that time and a young age and the fact that I had to sit and do maths homework was like oh this is the worst but now I look back and I'm like so yeah. in admiration that he would even have the energy to do that and it was all to better me so <coughs> so let's take the the viewpoint when I was younger I saw him as um, almost a little bit um, embarrassing because he would be everything that he did he would become quite quickly the like the leader of or like he would join the uh, we would join one football team and then he would like become part of like the <laughs> organization of that football team or we would go to church and he would be the one going up and like making funny joke and like in front of everyone and then going and standing up and te saying a speech but actually being the speech would be so good. So there was almost like this little bit of, ah, my, my dad's the embarrassing one who's always getting up. And it was always, uh, and, uh, and it was only at a later, older age, probably when actually I went to university and then was uh, more mature to be like, wow, my dad is so cool because most parents yeah. are not like that. And like, yeah. how lucky am I to have that? And then I remember him aiming to retire at 50 and then he did that. Um, and he went to see like a, a financial uh, advisor at 23. He was like, I want to retire at 50. And the financial advisor's like, it's going to be pretty hard. Mm. And he's like, no, I'm going to do it. And he's like, okay, well, you would need to do this and this mm -hmm. and save this and yep. see. And he's like, okay. And, and then he did it. And he, and I think I only really saw that at a later older perspective of like, wow, my dad's so cool, and now I see him facilitating and, and doing creating job clubs and, like, all of this in retirement that he's now almost busier than ever, and he's such, so social. Everyone wants to play golf with him, to cycle, to do all of these things because he's actually just an awesome human being uh, who everyone wants to be around and I guess as a younger person you, you don't see that right he's like he's the guy when you go to Italy and you're at the you're doing a guided tour and he's the guy at the front of everyone wants to move on because everyone's legs are hurting and he's the one asking the th uh, 10 questions <laughs> and you're like oh not again dad and like me and my mom and my brother would be like oh it's so embarrassing <laughs> but like he was that guy but now I look back I'm like he was just curious and that's like so awesome yeah. So I celebrate that now, and and I would like, I want to become like like that. That's yeah. that's like the a, a perfect outcome. I I love that, and I can see a lot of him in you in a way. It's like, my mother's a little bit like that too. I, I remember having a basketball tournament and I tried to be a tough guy, you know, hanging out with the bad boys environment. It was a street ball tournament. We would get into fights. We rocked this tournament, and my mother was always walking in the middle of the court while the game is on to take some pictures of me when I was shooting free throws. I was like. Oh my God, in front of, I'm trying to be tough here, go away. But then I kind of learned that whether it's with a partner or with a child, I don't think, if you're not embarrassing them at some point, you're not loving them hard enough in a way. And when that embarrassment goes away, you you have these, these, um, this feeling of, an, of a warm hug that never really leaves you. 
And I think that is something you can't really measure in money. It's like the feeling of being loved and supported and that somebody believes in you. Mm. Um, what do you think is your father's superpower now looking back at it? Well, just as you said that, I was going to say that if you're a parent and you can embarrass your son or daughter, you're involved. Hmm. You're, you're involved to a certain level where you understand them, but you can also put yourself in situations that they deem to be, you need to be there. And therefore you can find those moments of embarrassing them, but in a fun way, right? You're not hurting them. And I think that's uh, a good uh, a superpower of my dad is to, to get involved. Uh, he is not afraid to put his hand up and if no one else is, wants to contribute or organize something, then he'll be like, I'll do it. Even though he has already a million things and running a, a huge company and all of these things, uh, I just, I, I looked, I think also I looked back and be like, how did he do it all? Like, how did he honestly have the energy to be having five, six hours of sleep per night and doing all of the things and caring and doing that? It's it's very admirable, and, and especially when you start working and you get out of your, your 20, early 20s and you're like, yeah. oh, man, life's so hard. Uh, so it's, it's um, yeah, I think that was a, a moment of, of being involved. Being involved. Interesting. Particularly, there's so many narratives that... Uh, a man within a family doesn't have to be involved like that and just has to be the superhero from afar and, and children are going to emulate them. But I, I like the philosophy you just, just outlined. It's like be there, be in their lives, rather than just be the cool person who shows up with a cool present on, on Christmas or the birthday. Coming of age, if we were write an autobiography about you, what do you think is the moment where Jamie became a man? I personally, when I went traveling for the first time and, and like I said, to America, that, that gave me like the, the struggle and the, the, uh, the scary element of life of realizing that it's just me and I need to sort out anything. Like there is no calling mom or there's no this or that or support or, and actually it all comes down to you. And I think that when you first travel by yourself, that was probably where I did that. There was definitely moments earlier when I remember my dad, 18, I'd already been drinking, but my dad was like, you're 18, let's go to the pub. Let's get your first pint. <laughs> and there was, that was like, actually thinking back, and we talked about a rites of passage, that was almost like a rite of passage mm. into, into adulthood and um, I think that's actually very important. And I have a friend who we've been talking a lot about rites of passage and as guys and society today, we just don't have that. We don't yeah. have that hunter gatherer transition from uh, child to adolescence to adulthood. Yeah. And we, uh, and, and he was describing that in hunter gatherer tribes that there is pretty much no, um, uh, like mental issues and uh, and and uh, also like body ailments, and there's just the healthiness of a community there, and it's through the different stages, and we as a Western world have have not got that anymore. Yeah. So he he is actually facilitating a, a group to bring people into this rites of passage and and moving into these different realms, and I think actually. I just realized right now that's what my dad did and he provided me that, that moment of like 18, let's go to the pub. So important. That my father did something similar that really just, just uh, speak to me. For my father, he gave me a cigar. I was, he did it a little bit too early in a way. I didn't really know how to smoke it. I thought I was going to die from it. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that feeling of, of being treated like a man that really mattered, meant a lot to me. And I feel you just outlined something that has... Uh, terribly fallen apart in the Western civilization where it's like, it's not necessarily clear what happens with a culture if if you don't have those transitional moments anymore. Because from a psychic, the psychological development standpoint, it appears to me that maybe if you don't have the celebrated 
rite of passage or transitional moment that the transition doesn't occur. I had in my last, last interview, I had the honors of le- uh, learning from Aguilal. She's, uh, I think, one of the most uh, famous uh, luminaries here on the island, million followers, best-selling author for uh, Wall Street Journal. And uh, she highlighted out to me that there's, uh, right now, there's no rite of passage, for instance, in the romantic sense anymore, particularly for women in a way, where we celebrate girls. And it's not cool to be a woman anymore. And she outlined that maybe it is a precondition to having a stable relationship is to have a man <laughs> and a woman who went through these kind of stages. And that made so much sense to me in a way. I feel like, okay, interesting. Maybe we have, we've, we've lost some things that we need to pick up back there. Mm. Speaking of love, first big heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> I feel a man learns a lot about himself, the world, and others if he... Uh, through that particular first encounter or something like this? I... Yeah, I had a relationship before university. Um, it was two and a half years and uh, my first love and um, it, it was it was wonderful. I think it came to a point of, of me, again, seeing the world as this bigger place and, and this is in terms of business and and uh, even playing like Xbox and realizing there's other people across the world who are quite similar to you and like well are these people let's go hang out let's let's meet each other so there was always a little bit more of a worldly view I remember at home I didn't want to stay in Newcastle uh, where I'm from and I wanted to go out into different parts of of so I remember going to university for one week and it just kind of blew my mind that there's like all of these people who were probably more aligned and more connected to me in the way I sort of saw myself in my my world going than my my girlfriend at that time. And not this wasn't like girls and boys, but like I think then I, I came to the realization that like she wanted to stay in her local and our local town and that really was not my future. And so I think I came back after a few weeks and we had a hard chat and, and broke up. And in a way, there was like a little bit of um, there was the sadness of closing that chapter because it was so good and, and so beautiful and we took many adventures and uh, weekends away and it was a really, really nice relationship. Um, and nothing was wrong, but there was just now this like almost freedom of possibilities out there in the world so there was almost like excitement in that as well so i don't know if it was necessarily heartbreak because like i was the one moving on and i was the one choosing and i think i maybe had a few of those ongoing is like i've been the one to seek more or seek something else um but what we had created in in the various relationship i've had has actually been awesome it's been really, really nice and connected and, and, and could have easily, happily stayed with this person, but actually have chosen that there's more out. There's, there's, some, there's something else I'm chasing out there. And actually, a lot of the girls have ended up saying like, hey, I want that for you. Hmm. Like, I want the best for you and I can see that, that you want something more and I don't know if I can provide that for you. I don't think I can. And so... Like go, go, Jamie. Like, like, this is this is your journey as well. And when you become a little bit more selfish, I I believe that's what actually gets you to that next level. Sometimes is is doing the best. And I've spoken to ex girlfriends and uh, after a few years, and they're like, "Wow, Jamie, I'm so happy you made that decision for us because I see that you're happy and I'm happy because we." Um, are not necessarily together and we're doing our own paths and if we'd stayed together there could have been a build up of this frustration because yeah. you cannot you're not getting to where you want it to go yeah I completely agree like sometimes it's not I feel like going to life with the mindset of like whatever happens as a consequence of you following your your highest impulses is the best thing that could potentially happen even if it leads to losing a person or losing a job or losing a friend or even like all your money or something like this. I always found this strange pattern that if you follow courageous faith, that 
and you're walking on your own personal path of your adventure, that it all makes sense looking back at it in a way. Yeah, it's truth. Yeah, truth. It's it's, it's truth, uh, right? Follow truth. Um, rites of passage. If you one day have a, a son, <laughs> you're taking that little fucker to the pub, <laughs> giving his first pint, and he loves. Yeah, he asks you about love. What do you wanna convey to him, or what are some of the first life lessons, maybe not only in love, that you would like to pass on to him that have been particularly useful or cherished or even like traditional to you? Well, I, I actually did this exercise. I'm pretty bad at journaling and and um, just just writing what's in my head. But I like to ask myself questions and that therefore activates me to answer these questions. And I realize, and I have been in sales uh, in, in a few jobs, is actually that by asking better questions, you get better answers and you learn so much more. And actually, the, m the less time you are talking, the more time you are learning. You have two ears and one mouth for a reason. Yeah. So I would really, uh, as a rite of passage and a... And um, an and advice for, for, my, for my son and children would uh, really make them ask better questions and allow them to like also think. Do you know when sometimes you ask someone like, hey, do you want, do you want this or that? Or give them a few options of, hey, do you want to go to this place or, or here tonight? And they go, I don't know. Well, I don't know. It's just kind of like a cop out. It's 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 like I don't want to. I maybe they have the the thinking behind, but they're not willing to share it. And I want to like really promote them to critically think and then to give a, a a reason for their decision as well. And so like really activate that, and then activate this curiosity to ask better questions. And sometimes people say like, "Oh, that person's boring," or like, "Ah, oh, like the conversation's just a bit dull." But that's actually more like point back at yourself. You're just asking the like bad questions yeah. because everyone is interesting. You just are asking the wrong questions. Yeah. And maybe a simple question could be like, hey, what do you do in your spare time? And that would activate a, a curiosity in you. Maybe they say knitting and you have no idea. You, you're like, wow, knitting seems really boring. But then you're like, what is it that, makes you excited about knitting. Oh, well, I get to go to this shop and this shop and this shop. Oh, and where is that material from? And like you go and you can learn something deep about someone else and their passions. Whilst also, and this is funny, the more you ask better questions and the more, listen, the more you listen, that other person becomes more fond of you and they lower their guards and they trust you more. Yeah. And they say, wow, Jamie's actually a friend because he cares for me. And so the relationship builds, and, and, and I think that's also a key for me is building better relationships has been through questions. So questions, uh, being curious, and realizing that it's actually about self to come up with uh, the real motivations and real um, answers instead of saying, I don't know. Mm. So instead of giving your son or daughter um, answers, you would encourage them to uh, tap into the idea of acquiring a question-based philosophy that's outside oriented that is very interesting um i also agree with the fact that if you want to make somebody like them it's it's much more effective than a positive reinforcement like you just love bombing the shit off them it's just just actually be interested in them and and, and listen to them and it's i had uh, the great privilege i think that my mentors were all psychotherapists at some point. And they always reminded me, like, if the conversation is boring, the error is within you, Daniel, because there are no boring people in this world. And that, was, that really stood out to me, is, is the idea of, like, if you, the conversation is not flowing well and well, it means you are only partially there and you're only thinking about yourself. Um, mentors. When you think of the word teacher, like, who came to mind? Was there any particular guide that you met in your life that had a special meaning for you? Many. I believe that we all, uh, and me specifically, have had many guides, uh, people to rely on, to be, people to go to, people I trusted, uh, from school teachers, sports teachers, 
uh, father, mother, and then uh, getting into the working world and having like my head of sales at my first startup. He really took me under his wing and um, allowed me to, to to become like who I am. I think as well. So so yes, ga- those guides and mentors and uh, teachers for sure. So so yeah, I've had many, and I think when you uh, and and the business and I guess we, we'll get onto this, but it's funny sometimes when you say the word mentor, and I almost want to stop using the word mentor. I think a mentor is applicable in in some cases, but sometimes people don't know either they are a mentor, but other people describe them as their mentor, but yeah. they're not actually. They're like, oh no, I'm not a mentor. And yeah. so a mentor, and maybe think individually, like, what does a mentor for you? Because everyone I asked in my user research, everyone has a slightly different way of describing what a mentor is for them. Someone who is long-term, someone who is short-term, someone who uh, I'm paying, someone is free, someone who uh, has been with me for 10 years, someone who is an a industry expert. So that sense, I, I've kind of tried to start moving away from the word mentor, also because people are a bit scared of it. So if I say like, oh, Daniel, wow, you've been so helpful. Can I, do, do you want to become my mentor? Yeah. Well, it's quite a loaded and you're like, whoa, I don't know if I'm ready to be a mentor. And like in your head, you're probably thinking, well, how long do I need to do this? Does like, is he going to pay me? Is it free? Well, I'm super busy with my time. Like how much time does he want from me? So all of these things kind of come up. And instead, I've I've tried to <laughs> ch- change that way of asking into, wow, Daniel, you, you look like someone who's who's been there, someone who is... Mm had the experience that I'm actually looking to to go and do myself. And so through that, that is a lot easier for you to to digest and go, well, have I been there? Yes, I've been there. Oh, maybe I can help. Yeah. Instead of this like um, big relationship word. Yeah. And so through that, I found that people who have been there are offer the best advice and can give you even if they failed, so uh, to build a SaaS business and they failed, well, maybe they have been there and they can identify things to 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 be careful of. Hey, Jamie, watch out for this. Watch out for this. There's there's people who are going to come and have conversations like this, and they're going to distract you. Well, that's wow! What an incredible conversation yeah. from someone who actually knows, rather than. Uh, and I think this there's a funny way of of seeing this. Sometimes you. Uh, might come out of universities, for example, and you're like, okay, I want to uh, go and become a, a marketing manager at like a huge uh, uh, global company and do advertising for them. Well, who do you typically go f- to to ask their advice? And like, should you go to this university or should you uh, get this kind of job? And so I say, if you're coming out of university, well, you go and speak to your mom and your dad and your friends around you and maybe a professor. And none of them have gone and done any of that stuff that you're trying to do and realistically are probably not going to give you the best advice in terms of like helping you get there or the people you need to speak to or the direction and the steps that you can take actively today and instead they will give you some either generic information or things that they've kind of heard from other people that can be helpful for sure but is it the real helpful information that will be a needle mover. And so that's what I'm building with being there is like get some guidance from also someone who's two steps ahead of you. Someone who is, they don't need to be this this top senior marketing manager. Um, they could just be someone who is like two years out of university who has worked in a startup and worked in a big corporate in advertising and they can relay, well, this is good for this, this is good for this, this is my experience. Be careful of this. When you go and have an interview, ask this question. Yeah. This question would be very helpful for you to ask. And through that, that is a, a much better guide. And that's what I'm uh, I'm building. And it also, on the flip side, activates anyone and everyone to become a knowledge sharer. Yeah. Because they're like, oh, I have had that experience. Oh, let, well, let me tell you about my experience. And through that story, others can listen and go, ah, okay, I know 
where to, to avoid and I know which direction to go and I know the steps that I need to, to take. That's such a, I never heard anybody on air make that point. It's, it's the idea that you need the right mentor actually. And it's, it's not always a good thing if you find a way to connect people who are too high up the mountain actually. It's one of the strange things. I don't think I ever shared it, but I found a way to get extremely competent mentors, I think almost a little bit too early, and I adopted their philosophies and mindset, but also goals. And I tried to pretty much, it put a tremendous amount of pressure to me in a stage where I actually wasn't ready to it. All the people I, I hung around with after being one or two years into entrepreneurship, they were making a million dollars per month. They wrote, they already had over a hundred bucks. They were New York Times best-selling authors. They were these intellectual giants. And, and there was this almost me almost crumbling under the pressure of my particular tribe during that point. And Jung once said, be wary of unearned wisdom in a way. And maybe it, there's a natural progression to you have to do a couple of things by yourself. And if you jump the stage and they take you there, maybe you can't breathe because it's just to up, up the mountain in a way. Does it make any sense? Yeah, and I think there's also the people who are five steps ahead, ten steps ahead, and that's too many because you need to make the first step. So don't get advice from someone who has built something ten years ago or don't get someone who is like making a million dollars a month when you're just starting your business. Like yeah. go and speak to someone who's just started making a thousand dollars to like two day um, who's been working on for the last few months. Like go and speak to that person because they have been in the trenches. They actually know what works because there's also this this almost fake guru market that is uh, being created and it's these core sellers and, and people who have made this million dollars and they're like, how can I leverage my time and make the most amount of money? Well, it's to create a course. And so they create a course that can often be very time consuming, um, but it's based on, on information that is maybe not relevant anymore today because yep. dropshippers is the perfect example where what worked even six months ago is not working anymore. And like ads change, Google uh, regulation changes, um, all of these different things prevents you from making the same amount of money. And there's, there's almost like an advantage. People are taking advantage of that. So go and speak to someone who is two, two steps ahead and that, and they're, they're there with you. It, it, you can create actually more friendship and, and like some of the best mentors who they don't know that like I see them as a mentor or the people who are going through the same stuff I am going. <laughs> so then we become this, this translatory relationship where it's, it's, it's free advice. We're just hanging out as friends, but we get to share the experience together. And that is actually progressing me further yeah. than going to someone who is 60 years old and has done this 20 years ago. I couldn't agree with you more. And back to rites of passage, if you would, what you mentioned earlier, if you, if you little, <laughs> little Jamie would have that first pint with you, is where you would encourage him to ask questions. I think much more than getting advice from a mentor is acquiring the philosophy that guides them in a way, so that you can become a better problem solver over time. Because I think like in this flexible approach, you you do you do your mentee a better service in a way. Um, you also mentioned that a mentor is somebody. Or like, what use do what word do you use right now? I, I I like the word knowledge sharer and knowledge seeker. Knowledge sharer and knowledge seeker. But what do you you mentioned also that, for instance, my co-founder Adrian Blackwood. He's a, he's been a mentor for me at some times in a way, but not only because of his many successes and him having raised millions of dollars and having pioneered in AI and and technology, but also because he failed and and he and in those lessons like of what he learned from being to a place where for instance he took big amounts of money from wrong people something like this he conveys this these these very useful personalized warnings to me where i was in a situation where somebody offered me a lot of money i think like three weeks or something like this and he he immediately says no because he knew that would come along with terms that would over the long run remind him of a situation where he paid the price mm. and what is maybe the biggest challenge you've faced in the like, last 10 years or something that 
gave you uh, that black eye that now has transformed into wisdom. Can be personal, can be entrepreneurial, can be. Well, I think the want. biggest black eye has been very recent for me. I <coughs> was in London and knew I wanted to be in Southeast Asia, so I moved. I actually arrived in Singapore. I saw Singapore as a bit of a a landing pad to understand where I wanted to be in Asia, and, and I thought maybe it would be Vietnam. I wanted to work in a startup, but I saw Singapore as British speaking. I had like one connection there who said he can like try and help me get a job. So I, uh, I arrived. Also, it would give me the opportunity to make money where I could fly into all of these different startup ecosystems around Southeast Asia and understand which is the best for me. So I arrived in Singapore. I, I tried. To, I went out for many pints and tried to meet as many people as possible and managed to uh, get a job. And in that moment, then I came back to Singapore and I started working um, in, in January. And then by April, sort of COVID was all kicking off by then. But I'd also just like super focused and I became like the top salesman at the company and really hit it off. So what I was doing is I, was earn, I started earning good commission. I was taking that money. I was putting it straight into to crypto because I saw crypto as, as a booming market and so as such an opportunity. And it was, it was, it was really <laughs> increasing day by day. It was, it was quite amazing. So I ended up making a bit of money and way more money than I thought. I was like, I'm, I'm rich. This is it. This is it. And... Um, I then got an opportunity to to move to Bali and become head of sales at a, another startup. And again, I probably took that risk because I um, I was more confident with my finances. I was like, well, I have this money. This is worst case scenario. I, I've got this. So I then end up coming to Bali, and there's a, that's another story. But I was 29 or 28 at the time, and I was like, started to like build my own villa. And I was like, wow, like this is it, I've made it. Um, and I remember at, at that point, crypto actually dropped and then dropped quite heavily. I had a hundred, like pretty much all my money there and it, 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 two thirds of it was lost. And so all of a sudden building a villa wasn't so, and I got all the architect designs back and everything cost way more than I anticipated, probably because I was also building more than I needed. And I ended up giving my money to a friend, or my one of my best friends' brothers, who was uh, huge into crypto and earning through this crypto scheme, and everyone was making high percentages, and it was like a, a known thing within the market. So everyone was doing it, and I'd give all my money to him uh, to earn interest to be able to afford the villa that I'd got these costs back, and mm. was and so that was a huge. Um, it, it, I, it almost was like too good to be true, and so I didn't believe it. And so there was a there was a backup by by him, like, hey, if anything bad happens, I've got you. Like, don't worry. He was a millionaire. I trusted him to like, okay, I don't, I'm not putting too much money in, but like, he's got me. If anything bad happens, okay, this is. And of course, how the story goes is that the money was lost. Through through theft of an employee of that company, and so I lost a hundred percent. I lost everything, and so no more villa, no more land, and I'd actually just given up the the land for a, another deal. So I actually lost everything, and this was one year ago in in October, and I lost everything. So mm. from from going from this like security blanket of like wow, I'm 28, building my own villa. Like, how crazy is that when I was thinking back when I was 15, 16, to be like being in that, to then suddenly uh, losing everything was like, pfft. whilst building this company, so I had no income, no nothing. I remember thinking and struggling hard and for weeks and weeks, it was like we didn't know what was happening. So again, it was like dragging out whilst I'm also trying to build this company. And then after being like, my parents are like, you've got nothing. You've got absolutely, you've got nothing in your bank account. You've got nothing. How are you going to survive? And I was like, if I go home, I will sit at home and just to be depressed because there'll be no friends, no network around me, no support that I've been building up for the last few years. And that would be so scary for me. And so there was like such a 
a hard moment, but it was like, I, I'm the only one going to get out of this. So I just had to keep pushing, uh, trying to figure out how to get money from different places to like, to also going from like living, not a high life, but like living very comfortably, not, not even thinking about money on a monthly basis to then going like eating like less, less food and warang food, spending $1, like $2 a day on food for my whole, whole day because I was so broke. And then going and living on like $600 a month uh, with everything. And so that was like a huge, huge hard time. And this was back in October. And then having a friend, my, well, some of my best friends arriving in December for like, hey, we're going to like planned all year to like have this trip. And I'm like looking, thinking, you guys are arriving. I'm like at the lowest point of my whole life. Yeah. And actually through them and... and they like say like it felt like they almost saved me and give me more life because there was a realization that like money is just money and it's and it's it's a it's a way of transacting into to like an I O U yeah um, and actually the real wealth in in life is actually about the friends and the connections that you create and and through that new life and energy that they got created. Uh, from them being here, plus other connections at like certain periods when I was like the lowest of low. I remember meeting some awesome new friends and thinking like, ah, maybe it's not all going to be bad. Yeah. Maybe there is a, uh, maybe there is an, some blue sky eventually. My father used to say, well, that's what remains after you lose, you lose all your money. <laughs> yeah. And then yeah. someone was telling me like, hey, maybe Jamie, this is just the, the lesson and yeah. and you weren't supposed to have the money. And what, what do you think if we stay with the the theme and you have one day your son loses everything like that? And you have another pint with him, <laughs> put your arm around him. What would you kind of advice or questions that you would give him in the particular situations when he is at his lowest low? Well, uh, and this is why I admire my, my dad. Is con on, he, he just was here and he has been very supportive and it, funnily enough, he always seems to be right. Every piece of advice and thing I go to and ask him and, and want to actually involve him more because I realize there's such a, out of everyone in the world, your parents are probably the most rooted to make you succeed out of everyone because that they're so selfless in their whole creation of you and bringing you up that they are the biggest fans. They're number one fans. So like, build that relationship with them instead of making this um, parent son child dynamic make them your best friend and actually through becoming best friends will realize that there's such a beautiful relationship and team that can be created and uh throughout me losing everything and some advice that my 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 father would just ask me um I think it was just lessons learned. It was like, hey, well, okay, this has happened. I'm not mad. And um, there's even a little bit of, of his money in that. And he never overreacted in terms of like, like, I never was like feeling like he was, it was like against me. It was always yeah. like, hey, I'm here to support you. How, like asking hard questions of course but asking some questions that i also needed to ask other people and like helping support me in that way so i think it was again just through that and then just understanding like what are the lessons that you've learned how what are the mistakes that you made and how are you going to prevent it from happening again and i think once you understand that as a like for my son for example as long as i saw that he understood the lessons that he'd or the mistakes he'd made and what he was going to do differently in the future, then I think that's good. And actually, an another thing I would want my son to do is go and have all of these scars. Yeah. Like the more scars that you have and the more experiences that you have in your life, well, then you're going to be better off. Yeah. Because um, it's like even going into a job interview and you might be the perfect person um, you might have all the qualifications, but someone else comes in that interview and they've already done a uh, hundred interviews and they've worked in all of these different companies and they have like all of this like real world company knowledge. They're going to like smash you in an interview, even though you might be the better suited like 
uh, skill wise, but they have like real life experience and people want to hire people who are problem solvers and can learn from their mistakes. I often have uh, coffee with my father, coffee and cigars, kind of a thing in a way, in the, in the deep woods of northern Germany. My father has always sits there with his shirt open, and my father has scars everywhere, in a way. He has fought in a war. And I remember that when we were talking about rites of passage, that men used to celebrate each other for, for scars, actually. It showed how tough you are. And I feel like our society has become so feminized mm -hmm. that failure and not doing everything perfect and not being beautiful all the time is being criticized and and we almost conditioned to become cowards by not trying things but not failing in a way but if we go back like we actually admired the person who was fucked up the most <laughs> because it's a testimony to courage of his his past your son asked you that give me a protocol on how to unfuck my life <laughs> he just lost everything maybe some people listen here in the audience and we have I think over 10,000 listeners by this point Some of them just went through what you went through. I went through that several different times in my life. I almost like these episodes. They are filters for me to realizing, are you really my friend? Even when it's not popular to be my friend? Are you really my girlfriend? Are you going to bounce the moment? I, I won't be able to provide the sexy home or something like this. What is the step-by-step uh, -step protocol you can, you can give to a particular individual that will lead them from zero to hero again? I think uh, one exercise that is simple and everyone can do right away is, is being grateful for the things that you have. So every day waking up, making a, a little morning routine, even though it's so hard to do the early stages slowly. Once you do like one thing that's super easy, I remember, yeah, I, I, would, I would have a book, I would get out of bed, And I was like, wow, this starts again. This is going to be hell. What a day. But just sitting down and saying like, hey, what am I grateful for? And it would ask me this question. Well, I'm grateful for my hand and that it's functioning and able to write and able that I have a brain and eyes that can see. And so the simplicity of like how we are, which we forget, allowed me to see that there is some light in the world. So that really helped starting a bit of a, a little morning routine where it would be like little habits, super easy, make it as easy as possible. So instead of saying like, I'm going to do 25 push-ups and this, I would be like, I need to do one, one press up, push up. Then you do one and you do way more than that. But it's the, the ease of make your bed, like these simple things that really helped me just and give me the encouragement, like, ah, oh, I can do it. It is up to me and I can do it. And slowly by um, that, give me a little bit more confidence in myself. Because in this low period as well, and I see this always, people don't like reaching out. It's so hard to, when you are struggling so much, the last thing you want to do is like ring someone else up who's your best friend and you know loves you and it's nothing about what you have. And they tell you, Sorry, and but you're scared because you think maybe they're gonna it's gonna bring them down and you're gonna disappoint them and you have all of these like expectations and stories that you're telling yourself which yeah. uh often are not necessarily true, but you feel it and you're so stuck in this just like this depth of like struggle. Um but whenever you speak to people who have had alcohol issues or drug issues or therapy and what everyone says similar they say well, just speaking to people, talking, sharing my struggles and becoming more relatable. It allowed you to just relieve a little bit of that pressure that was like boiling up. It's like a kettle and you just need to like spurt it out a little bit and be yeah. like, ah, like when someone's like, how's your day? And you're like, fucking shit. Like this, it's pretty terrible and like everything's a bit grim and gray and, the, and it's almost like a bit of a relief for other people. I see it where they're like, Wow, someone's actually telling the truth. Instead of like, how are you doing? How are you doing? Yeah, great. And you know, like the like deep down suffering. <laughs> yeah. And there's something so beautiful with that. So, I'd say that little morning routine in terms of gratitudes. Um, I I did I made a little morning yoga flow and um, a workout. Um, 
and getting out and into communities and I started like this gym class thing where it was all around people and just started being around people more who brought my energy up. Uh, even if I was quiet and not saying anything to anyone for the whole morning, it just gave me a little bit more energy around others. And so that really helped me be in an environment and changing, I think, your environment also is is key. You are your environment and you can so easily get drag down and just the same 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 so yeah and often money is not a thing but like message a friend and be like hey have you got a tent or like go and rent a tent for a weekend and just get into nature and like go through the struggle of like going and doing something free uh or take a yoga mat and like or a hammock and like go and live in the woods for like a, f a night or two and like go and see how it is actually to like struggle and you'll realize how nice it is to have a roof and a bed and electricity and a toothbrush and like all of a sudden you feel like ah oh, my life's not actually that bad yeah and in through that gratitude and realization it kind of like pushes you through to like ah oh, there is better things coming yeah and that encouragement i think gives you the confidence to to start moving in the right direction um also very simply is like uh, we also get very overwhelmed and I, I at that time I was so overwhelmed I had like people chasing me for money and like scooter guy um, calling me pretty much every day it was like a absolute it was I remember getting super ill at the time uh, for like two weeks in bed and those and little just, calls are the worst aren't they uh, yeah and it's it's like all the stress mounts up and then one thing again you get so overwhelmed you get so overwhelmed with everything that you just shut down and you cannot do anything and so slowly you you build yourself up and and it has to come from within as well i feel like um there's a there's a there's a depth that now i know that i have of such a low that i'm like okay well now i'm like how do i and, and now it's like how do i prevent myself from spiraling into that that depth again um, but to prevent yourself from getting overwhelmed in those situations as well is just, just put one thing on your to-do list, just one. Wake up, you might have 10 things to do, but all I'm going to focus on is one thing that I think is probably the most important thing that needs to be done today, and after I do that, you typically feel fucking good. You're like, I smashed that. Wow, it only took me an hour to do that. Okay, I'm going to do something else now. And so now you actually do more and then you just feel good so make it so easy and simple and i think that's kind of what allowed me to get out of of the struggle that i was in that's a wonderful protocol thanks so much for sharing that for for people to encapsulate that is so when you have a rockdown environment you pretty much the first thing you do is you start controlling what you can control and focus on those areas in a way it's that speaks so much to me my father was a commando and he always taught me stories of where he froze in war and freezing in war is like from a psychological perspective very dangerous because you can't really move away from the people who shoot at you if you're, <laughs> if yeah. you're scared and he had these, these funny example that he made he said like Daniel in those kind of situations I had one of my instructors he, I saw him and he wiggled his toes and he said like he would start with tiny areas of his bodies that were not freezing started to move them and then would regain control over his body and managed to negotiate himself out of this this fear possession was able to move again in a way wow. so that's a i think like something that, that that i just learned from you is when you're in this particular situation is be humble enough in scaling down uh, the obligations that you have to what you can actually manage in a way and if it's not in your capacity for that particular day to call 50 lawyers and to you know, make make all the fix the problem like fix one tiny thing that you can have and even if that is as small as wiggling your toes the next thing i heard from you is an outside focus one of the things that i learned from when i wrote the book series about anxiety and cognitive therapy was that people who have uh, panic attacks focus on their internal emotions in a way and for me these podcasts and my psychotherapy background has been so curative or eat just beans for a couple of days to prove to themselves that they are in fact uh, 
in the position to endure that, and then they fear that less. And the last thing you mentioned is, I think, behavior scaling. Um, yeah, I hope that helps whoever is listening to this. Mm, how to make it worse? <laughs> how to make it worse? worse? What is like maybe three things they should not do when, when they have their dark night of the soul? I think we all, the first thing that stands out is this, the spiral, the storytelling, the, the spiraled storytelling that we have our minds and it's uncontrollable and it will continue until you stop it. And I, that's why I say like change your environment, um, go and sit in a cafe, even if you can't, have, like you can't afford uh, a coffee, go and sit there and ask for some water or take a water bottle and just change that environment, change the spiraling narrative that we have in our minds. Distraction. Um, it almost would seem a little bit silly to, to do it, but at, the var at that moment of spiraling, I think distractions can help in, in a good way. Go for a run, free things. And um, running really helps, but yeah, physical activity has, has sorry, you ask for things that don't do. Do not go for a run. Do not not go for a run. Mm. Uh, don't don't stay yeah it's st don't stay motionless with just your mind and if yeah. you're just using your mind then uh, it's gonna win it, because because it is uh it's trying to protect your ego and it's trying to um protect you and it's making you scared it's the scared of the outside world that you've failed and you shouldn't go out there and you c it's embarrassing and all of these natural ways of trying to protect you is actually just making you feel scared and lonely and yeah. vulnerable and it's a very frightening place to be so yeah changing that that mind frame is is actually getting out um moving your body um what are some other things that you shouldn't do i think those are already some some great points um one of the things we learned about today is that uh, today's successes can be the precursor to tomorrow's failures I think just as it is important to warn about uh, what happens when you lose everything, so sometimes those are safer episodes in people's personal journey because you are alleviated of all the potential mistakes you could do. You know, it's like one of the things that I'm afraid of right now, to be quite honest, even though I'm never afraid, is. Um, there's a lot of money coming in from you. It's like, this is the first time in my life where I'm going to the United States in, in, in eight weeks. We're going to get a big race over there. We already have some confirmations. It's, that's a lot of like, more potential to do some mistakes than I've ever been done before. And I'm not particularly looking forward to that in a way. How do you handle prosperity? What is some advice you can have there, like some, some warnings for somebody who would anticipate uh, good times? Without going or as without like going to these circles of, they get a lot of money and then they lose a lot of money. What would you say to that particular person? Any advice? I think we can all let our minds and the narrative lead us a little bit astray and, and frighten us. I think a little bit of awareness to it is is okay, um, but ultimately, what you can you control? I can control my actions on this day getting up making me thrive building the environment the routine for me um and then having people around you who you deeply trust and can get you to where you are um where i actually think it's better to go out in the world and try and make mistakes try and go fast try and do these things that are going to make mistakes because then you learn faster mm. it's like uh, this test and learn lean startup methodology where like Amazon, for example, is testing so many things per week, way more than other startups that allow them to get to the stage they are because they just, instead of another corporate, they've tested 300 things in the time that they have tested three other things. So through that test and failure, you learn so much more. And actually I encourage that in all the businesses and my teams that I've built. Um, and it also allows people to like not be afraid of making that bolder decision. So actually, I just encourage it and, and maybe um, talking through those, those like, hey, I'm worried of this and I'm worried that I'm going to lose the money because of this. Well, that could just simply be a, a limiting belief of mm. 
and mm. and talking through that with someone who is trained, talking through that uh, with an advisor of a startup who has been there and done it. Like you say, hey, I'm worried about raising this amount of money and not being good enough to actually be able to like build the company that I envision. I'm sure as a, as a, as an entrepreneur, we all have that. Um, uh, maybe an imposter syndrome of, hey, I might get this money, but now what do I do with it? <laughs> I need to build something. Um, that Find someone who's been there to give you a bit of guidance, and now you have that like ability and that safety net of like, hey, I can keep going back to them. I can keep going back to this person and asking them questions. And through that, you will realize like, ah, I've got this. And then I think it comes down to like sitting down and you concentrating. I think if we concentrate and put our minds to one task at a time, we can do it. I think we think that we can't do it because we're getting so distracted. Um, I've started using a, an app called Clockify, which has been so simple and easy. It's a simple timer. It is as simple as that. It is you write what time, what task you're going to work on, and you start the timer. Boom. I became so much more productive because I'm just focusing on one task at a time yeah. instead of jumping between this and that. And as a founder, you're getting messages from marketing to this and that is immediate. And this, and if I just focus on one task, I get it done so much more productively, faster, if, uh, effectively, and to a better quality. And then, and then I stop the timer yeah. and I move on. And yeah. that has been a really interesting way for me to get way way ahead yeah it's i couldn't agree more it's like i've taught sales and persuasion to uh, to a lot of leaders from the mental health industry and they were all often complaining about their sales being low and uh, i challenged them pretty much to m like measure the time that they actually put in outreach and they they were complaining the tactics don't work and when they started to measure it they realized oh fuck i've been doing 90 minutes of sales in, in the last week and I'm complaining here my business is not growing it's input it's, 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 it's actually input. input and I think because I've had the sales background I know yeah, the could you tell us a little bit about this this chapter of your life because I feel like you're this is one of the things where you're world class at so maybe you you help us a little bit in in understanding your philosophy behind sales and um, helping us to understand some of the things you accomplish in that sector but also maybe if you would design like a micro workshop right here, right now, what do you think would be the first exercise or lesson or something that somebody could learn from you since you've been been there as somebody who built successful sales teams and closed a lot of deals? I remember there was one guy, uh, I won't name names, but he came into our sales team when I was l working in London in a, in a startup uh, there and it was his first day and I was almost like his guide or uh, I don't know what you call it mentor for the for the day and uh, it was his first day and we, I was like okay great we used HubSpot to say okay you're going to call this business we were calling small businesses and I a bit of advice I was like you are going to be terrible for the first hundred calls that's it you are going to be so bad they are going to want to hang up on you straight away so the best advice I have is just get through those 100 calls because at 100 calls, you're going to be a little bit better, still going to be pretty bad, but you're going to be a little, like you're probably going to be at least past the first part of the conversation where someone's actually interested and you'll have gone through enough conversations to get yeah, there. And what I saw he, he did is you, he looked at this business and then he went on their website and he looked at all of them, the shipping, it was a, a shipping startup looked at the shipping policy and looked at all of this research and, and he spent 10, 15 minutes on this this person and then he was like, okay, I'm going to do it. And then he would click dial and he'd sit there with his mic on and ring, 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 and no answer. And he'd just waste it and then he would be like, <gasps> and then he would then go to the next person and he would spend 10, 15 minutes looking at them. Ring, 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 ring. Ring, ring, no answer. <laughs> Again, so he just wasted 30 minutes on yeah. two people that didn't even pick up the phone. And so my, my best advice would be the input. You're going to be pretty bad, but the best way to improve is just to do the repetition. And that's yeah. something I realized more recently, actually, is like people, it's like, I had a friend who's like, uh, dr amazing drawer, 
super cool. And I was like, but how do you draw so good? And he's like, I just, I just do it all the time. Yeah. And actually, it re made me realize we as humans can do anything. We just need to do it enough times. Um, if you go and play tennis every day, you are going to get better. And you are going to probably beat majority of people if you're training every day. You might not be the world's best, but you are going to be pretty good and beat 80%, 90% of the population. Um, and so when it comes to sales, the repetitions, um, do them, do the inputs. We all think that we can only do... Um, yeah, it's funny. In Clockify, this app makes you realize of how much you are not doing. You're like, oh, tough day. I've done so much work. And you look in Clockify, done like two or three hours. And I'm like, wow, I'm not even focused on an individual thing. And so I think the inputs uh, would be number one. Um, I like to think of like I'm getting through 100 no's to get to the one yes. Yeah. And then something weird happens in sales is once you do the 100 no's, you get a bit further in the conversation. And you're like, oh, okay, I'm kind of getting this. I kind of know what to try in, this, in the first few words to get them to like open up and be curious enough to keep listening. Um, you get to the one yes. And then all of a sudden, like after five more calls, you get to another yes. And you're like, oh, something's working. And then another one and you get another yes. And you're like, wow, something's working. I, it's, it's working. But actually, yeah. it's just through your repetition and through. And then the second point I like to make in, in terms of sales is you don't need to know anything about this topic because the perfect example would be I moved to Singapore and I started selling economic, uh, macroeconomic research to CEOs in my market was Australia and New Zealand. I was in charge of that. So I was calling up all the biggest bank investment, um, uh, private equity companies, all of these VCs, selling research and uh, knowledge that I had no idea about. And luckily, my brother had done economics at, at university. He gave me a few lessons. Still, I'm not going to remember really anything in, in, in a few lessons. So I quickly realized, like, I can't talk to these CEOs on their level of understanding what I'm selling. But what I can do is show up on the time I can uh, give them the ability to know that they can trust me. And and I at that moment, I realize I'm a relationship seller. So I turn up, I am persistent. And that's my third thing, actually, is persistence in terms of, like, I know I'm selling you something that is valuable. You know that you most likely need it and would, would actually benefit from it. And as long as I will keep going and, and approaching you, and I didn't have the like, oh, no, it's, I'm spamming them. I just saw it as like, hey, I'm selling something valuable. I will keep going. And I would encourage them, hey, in my emails, tell me if this is annoying. Like, tell me to stop emailing. Of course, I will, I will stop right away. And that's what kind of pushed me is this persistence of like being on time, showing up, becoming that trusted. If you tell someone, hey, I'll email you this afternoon, or I'll email you by tomorrow morning email them by tomorrow morning because they're like oh wow like even if they're like i'm not interested they'll be like at least what he said is he's he's keeping to his his, his promise and that's yeah. like encouraging so so i think those things do the inputs uh do way more uh alex amosi says uh counted by hundreds if no one knows alex amosi go and check him out he's that huge dude on uh on youtube who uh has got a nose strip and he's uh incredible in, in sales and He's been such a good guide, and anyone thinking of getting into sales, go and check him out, uh, Alex Hamosi. Um, he counts things by hundreds, and yep. uh, I think that's a really good lesson for, for sales. Um, be persistent and show up and just go in for the relationship. Go in to, to – I was. it's funny. I was. These CEOs were so busy, and I would chat for 20 minutes sometimes about absolute garbage. I don't know what we talk about barbecues and cause Australia and, yeah. and, and random stuff, but it allowed me to become a relationship and build a relationship with them yeah. that they almost felt a bit bad, like lying to me. And so like at the end of the thing of the chat or whatever, I'll be like, Hey John, like realistically, we know that you would like this. It's going to benefit your team. You want it. You have 8k in, 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 in the budget. Um, I think I can push something through for 12K. Can we do it? And I would just be very upfront and honest with them. And, and, and obviously, it depends who you're selling to. But the, through that relationship, I was able to ask these harder questions and be a little bit more straightforward because there was a relationship. And so 
um, I would also advise that obviously each person is individual to their own characteristics and that is something but showing up um, is key thank you so much for sharing that I, I love that it's 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 I'm I'm being a guest on tell me on journey from Anatoly a friend of mine and I he scaled these companies from zero to I think 10 million with uh, with Amazon And he said, I asked him what's an advice, like a question he should be asked more often for starting entrepreneurs. And he said, do you actually like the fucking product? And for him, it was about like, if you believe in what you're selling is a, is a net plus for the person in front of you, tonality and all those things are going to take care of themselves in regard to change. And I personally felt it was so difficult in the past when I had fallen out of love. It's something that I sell just because I, I felt like a fraud in a way. So... Selling yourself on your product and on yourself is, 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 is key. The next thing you mentioned is being a relationship seller, realizing it's a human endeavor first and trust and all these kind of uh, things are important. Persistence. Yeah, I like that, with the, particularly with the clockify thing. Volume count in 100 and having the character for salesperson, which is being honest. You just mentioned something about to closing. Any particular advice for people who want to become closers? Um, I had a friend who just recently was asking uh, in, in her, she was potentially getting, getting a new role in, in her business, uh, in a business that just they bought them. And she was like, Jamie, I, I've done the leads. I understand the account management side. I just haven't done the closing. What do you think I should do and, and get into? Because I feel like I should do the lead side. And actually, I was like, well, if you go and do the closing, you'll get the full cycle and you'll understand the ability to, uh, one, become like a head of sales because you understand the whole sales cycle. Yeah. Um, when it comes to, 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 to closing, again, I was persistent um, knowing that they would benefit it and, and chasing leads that I knew that would benefit from the first meeting. And so you're not, you're not being persistent with people who are, don't see the value and, and not a good fit. You're chasing the people who do see it. So identifying the right person and going after them and then just, just being frank and honest and open and be like, hey, dude, it's okay if you don't want this or it's okay if you cannot afford this right now. It's okay if... Mm. But... but uh, it's obviously like a no for now or is it a no forever? And like sometimes that allows you to just go like, hey, it's not a good time for three months. Cool. Put it in your diary. You're like, damn, I lost that deal. But three months comes back so quickly yeah. and it's the happiest day ever when you see it in your calendar. You're like, oh man, I forgot about this guy. That's a 10K deal. I'm going to message him again. And he's like, hey, I'm actually in, in this is the right time now. Yeah. Um, not forcing things on people that they don't want. I think uh, people think like, oh, you're going to be like a, a greasy salesman and push product that you don't want to sell and you know it's not a good fit with them. Hmm. Like, be honest from the very start. And I think if you go yeah. in an honest policy and like selling a car that you know is broken down, well, yeah. that karma kind of comes back and hits you instead of being that one maybe sales guy in the car showroom who's very honest and like everyone loves that guy. Everyone loves the sales guys. Like, hey, I wouldn't actually buy from from like these range of cars, but you know what? I have some more cars coming in next week. I think it's probably better if you save yeah. and then I come in next week because yeah. uh, there's going to be, uh, and like that trust that is built from that yeah. um, allows you to become that relationship seller and doing the right thing. And from my ethos as, as, yeah. as my, my dad ethos has given me the ability to stay true and honest and transparent. And that always seems to work out. And good calm. I was just listening to Naval this morning and he talks about like four, four types of look. And I know some of my friends in my life who I love and I, I adore. And I, they always, and I always ask them more recently, it's like, oh, do you think you're a lucky person? And every single one of them who I identified as like super special, they'll say, yes, I'm a very lucky person. But I think you create your own look. You put yourself into situations that... Uh, give you opportunities and through that I think um, you might not sell that car that day but that guy comes back with his son the next yeah. week or he comes back with that with a friend who says like oh hey go and speak to that sales guy because he's actually a bit more honest and tells you the truth 
and that way I think closing deals becomes easier. I don't think of closing like immediately, I need to close this. It's like long-term. Long-term relationships pay off. See it as a long-term uh, game. I love this so much. It's, it reminds me of when we started earlier, like one of the commonalities between you and me, Jamie, where that we started being civilized through sports in a way. And I remember that I had this phase where I had this, was becoming so athletic and I could just dominate teams in, in front of me and I would no longer pass the ball. And I had this one coach, uh, shout out to you, Boris, who, who took me inside and like, you're being a cunt here. And this, is, this is also about becoming better at the game of life not just basketball in a way. And I think like one of the commonalities among bad salespeople is they, they, they are very psychopathic and predatorial. They consume the person in front of them for immediate gain. And what they lack is the idea that if you think about this in a 15-year time window, like maybe you have to play this game with this person again. That's what my coach told me. It's like, yes, you, you cook their asses in practice today and you told them they ain't shit and they're trash and they will never amount to anything and, and they have no chance against you. But these people, you have to meet them tomorrow. <laughs> yes. And they won't like you if you treat them like this. Exactly. Know, right? And it's, it's, and it's this, this idea of like sustainability sales is, is I think like something that is is just from a pragmatic standpoint, like a way superior philosophy to go to persuasion. Would you agree with that? Eh? Yeah. Um, I think if we all think back to school, and I remember walking down the corridors at school, you have your backpack on with your big books. There was always like the popular kid who you liked. And that person was always nice. He was nice to everyone. She was nice to everyone. She was popular not because she was wore the coolest clothes or she was the prettiest or he was the, the best at sport. It was because they were just a nice person. They treat everyone the same. Yeah. And they were friends and able to be friends with many different groups because everyone just saw them as being uh, nice and honest. And, 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 and I think that's like doing the right thing. Yeah. It was a long-term relationship people saw. They, they saw the, the bigger picture rather than the short-term game. And I think that applies to every everything, everything in life. And I think that's why I've picked up so many gems as friends is because I've been open to that and I've been able to um, uh, be honest and open and um, and do by doing the right thing, karma uh, comes around in, in roundabouts and, and hits you slap in the face. And especially we know in Bali, it has instant karma. Um, indeed, indeed, something in the it's a very spiritual island. I feel. Yes. I feel it is a it is a mentor in itself mm. in a very strange sense. Um, you have been very innovative in your approaches. I feel. Could you tell the story of how you use crowdfunding to boost one of your ventures and to make it happen in a more untraditional way? Mm. Yeah. So there is. A few ways to raise money for your business. You can have an idea, and that's what I had in, in, in my case. I hadn't even built anything yet. So it was simply an idea that I had, and I was like, okay. You're talking about uh, been, been there. Yeah, right? been there. Um, I hadn't built anything, but I knew to build and to attract the talent and to build a, a good team, which I wanted to be surrounded by, we needed money. Um, and to do that and to grow it at the scale and, and, and speed, uh, we would need some money. So there's a few ways. You can go to venture capital firms um, who typically take a little bit of time and there's a lot of uh, procedures and, and pitch decks and pitching, which I think is a good way to get feedback. You've got angels who are individuals who can invest 20, 30K, um, a bit more, and uh, they will be a lot quicker to get money, but uh, they um, may be harder to find if you don't know exactly how to. Um, Crunchbase is a, is a great way to, to identify these people. And then there's a newer way, this is called equity crowdfunding. So it's similar to Kickstarter, which people might have heard of. Kickstarter is a, is a platform where you, um, instead of equity, it's, it's, it's products. You're selling a product that you can fund and then in three months, six months, you get the product delivered to you. So it's like an upfront payment, um, crowdsourcing um, of, of getting the money to allow you to buy big amounts of yeah. stock to, to do that. And so equity crowdfunding is similar to 
um, Kickstarter, but it's selling equity uh, shares in your company. And it gives you and the community an ability to buy into companies that you really believe in. And so I went on the site right at the start and I saw this burger van. I was like, no way. There's a burger van just um, you know, somewhere in America. And there's a company called, there's a few companies out there. The one is, is Kickstarter, which is the biggest in, in, in the U.S. Um, and you have to be registered in the U.S. to, to, to get on the platform, uh, your business. And so I saw this burger van raising like 100K and it was a burger van. I was like, oh, wow, this is amazing. People just believed it because he had a community of customers around him that actually believed in his food and, and what he was doing. And now he was like raising money to get a, a storefront. Um, and it gave me the ability and, and realization like, oh, wow, I can, I can put my idea out there and I can get firstly feedback to see if it's good enough and, and see if we can raise this money. And so, so that's exactly what we did. Um, and we managed to raise 125K uh, USD on a platform just from the idea. Hadn't really built anything, had, had lots of conversations and user testing and uh, not user testing, sorry, user research where I'd like interviewed and surveyed uh, many people to understand the product that we were building, refined it, but also refined it when we were putting it out there, conversating, every conversation kind of like, oh, I hadn't been asked that question before. Oh, well, this is what I would do for this user, or this is how yeah. a uh, expert's profile would be set up, which I hadn't necessarily thought of, but in that spot, and that is actually kind of, I think a skill of mine is thinking things through on the spot and being able to think of it deeply, um, which I maybe hadn't thought so deeply about previously. Um, so anyway, raise 125K, I think it's a great way to raise money, uh, test out your yeah, idea. Um, for people who never raise money, I think, I raised money last year for uh, it was a project called Eternities, where I had this idea of uh, building AI avatars for everybody. That there's this platform that I can do this with, and of course, uh, you know, like my current venture is doing this for luminaries and celebrities, and it's it's a different approach. No longer the YouTube with avatars, but while doing it, I found it incredibly hard in idea stage to raise money. It was just hard. It was like for me personally, being armed with a PowerPoint and going into an office and saying, "Yo." Want to give me half a million dollars? It's a good idea I have. It's, I never did something like this before, but you should give me. It was a very challenging experience for me. Like I got lots of projections, and I learned a lot, but I feel it's uh, so just so that people can understand raising 125K on an idea stage without a functional proof of concept is quite something, I feel, in a way. Yeah. So, and then throw in losing all your money at the same time. And, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, being at a very low point, and still struggling through it and finding the energy to like get um, these rejections. Um, one thing that equity crowdfunding funding. How do you do crowdfunding? Like it's like if, if you would uh, just like you walk people to becoming a salesperson, how do you become a crowdfunder? Because it's it's a different form of sales, but in in the in the end you're selling something, right? Yeah, it's 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 simply your you have to create a pitch deck uh, where people can see on a PowerPoint very easily. You have a a problem and you have the solution and um, you create that for a VC for a, for an angel investor so you do the same exact you create your pitch and put it onto equity crowd platform like WeFunder for example on there people would see it they see the story and they go hmm I like this and sorry I, I forgot to say the biggest benefit is equity crowdfunding anyone can invest up to uh, minimums $100 hmm. so now all of a sudden you get all of these individuals who might just, they really believe in what you're doing, but they just don't have a lot of cash. Well, $100, $500. I had ranged from $100 all the way up to $15,000 in my campaign. Um, and simply put it out there. And you, you have to then, there's all the activities that you have to definitely do. So it's about reaching. So really the, 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 the plan for equity crowdfunding is to like, almost try and have a bit of a community. So you so you might have your idea, but first, when you have your idea, go and build that community. Find that community of people who would actually like that product. Speak with them, create um, a bit of an offer, survey them. Okay, then you're building your pitch deck. You'll maybe put it out onto a equity pr a platform like WeFunder, and then you're driving traffic to it. The point is to drive as much traffic to your page as possible because a certain percentage of those will, will convert. Um, and they will invest in your company. How did you do that? What was your uh, 
How did you send people to the website? Yeah, For people who don't know. I think there's a range of different ways. You've got um, creating and finding, uh, like creating lists of customers, creating uh, lists of people who um, will have um, likely be interested in your product. So that could be different communities, Facebook groups, finding, there's also like finding emails, finding people on LinkedIn. Um, there's many different ways to kind of find individuals who can can do that, um, can, can get involved. Um, and then once you get them to the page, you can survey them, you can be sent, and before you can like send them an email to say like, hey, I want to get some feedback. And another, I, you often hear this with investors is go and ask for advice yeah. and feedback rather than money. And through that, they will actually be able to come and give you a way better. But also you can incentivize them like, hey, I pay them. Hey, I'm paying people $50, $20 to fill out this survey. And through that, you build up the trust. You send them the money. They're like, oh, wow, this, this, this guy is actually truthful. They said, and so now they're willing and invested to try and help you even more. And so you can reach out again and be like, hey, the feedback you gave me on this survey was incredible. Do you mind if we could have a 30-minute call? Boom, now you're on a call with them and then you're like getting some more feedback and you're like, hey, what would it take for you to invest in a company like this? Well, I would need to say this, this, this. Okay, great. You go and do those things. Perfect. And then you go back to them and say, hey, I added this and I added this, exactly what you said. Would you invest now? Oh, no. And it's, there's objection handling and, and objections in there. And then someone said, well, what else would I need to do? And then you can then go and, and, and sell to those individuals or you can just get so much feedback that it's so helpful for you yeah. in, in your project. So speaking to them, building that um, community base and, and overall just getting feedback will get you to the to the limit. And you can, I think, the minimum is $50,000 to on, on WeFunder. Um, and there's other things. There's, there's agencies out there. There's um, social media, creating lots of videos, creating podcasts about your product and then making shorts and, set and, and posting it out every day. Like there's many ways to, to drive traffic to your page. Ads, many different ways. Thanks for sharing that. Um, interesting, so server tactics. So in the end, it's still a psychological game in a way. Like if you, what we mentioned earlier, when you said being persistent and showing up on time with the CEOs where they learned, ah, oh, interesting, they sent me my money back. It's mm. like, uh, don't we look always for opportunities if we can trust the product, the salesperson, and the company in itself? Yeah. Yeah. I'm writing a book right now about objection handling. It's, ah, nice. I find it the only, one of the only persuasive tactics that stays stable over every single domain. What has been effective for you, and what is your objection handling process that you run through? And for those people who don't know, it's uh, objection handling is... Uh, Almost like a very dark, potentially psychological skill where you transform a, a no into a yes or into a later or something like this, where you use uh, a couple of different tactics to stay cool in the moment. How do you handle objections, Sammy? I learned objection handling at the very my first startup in London. I was there for three years. We had a head of sales. A few different ways. One is... having calls having a hundred calls <laughs> if you have five calls you're going to hear five different objection handling uh, uh, objections um if you have a hundred calls now you have a much bigger data set to understand okay these three are the most uh, prolific objections that people have okay now uh, together as a team you say okay what is this objection handling how what is and then the second thing is asking questions about their objection it's too expensive. What is too expensive to you? And like you're coming back with them some questions of, of um, uh, you they say like ten thousand dollars is too expensive. So would you say five thousand dollars is too expensive? Is one thousand dollars too expensive? And so through questions is the second step, is coming back with them and you what you're doing actually and majority of objections are not actually objections. They're just like I want to get this guy off the phone. He just yeah. cold called me and like I I'm ugh, I don't know but like I will check this out after because it sounds actually like okay. Obviously you're ringing someone as a targeted lead. That's how you should do it anyway. So 
You're just asking co uh, questions and ultimately you're keeping the conversation going. As long as you keep the conversation going with some simple, easy questions, they um, um, would allow the conversation to keep going because they feel too rude to hang up on you. And then you can get into the, to the phase of um, using the internal team to, to identify which are the objections that you're getting and then work on those. Work on the top three, the top five, and slowly you'll get better at it and then you'll start to turn. And then they will flick between those three yeah. on the phone call and then you're, you're good and you'll hear new ones and you'll be like, you'll be almost, we got to a point in the team where we'd celebrate. We'd be like, wow, we've got a new one. We've got, oh my, hear this, hear this. Someone said this today and you're like, ooh. And then you're collectively as a team and I think this is what brings this like beautiful thing in a sales team is like, oh, how can we, because we know the product's good and we know that it's it's just an <laughs> objection. So like, how can we work on it and go back to them? And yeah. so then remember, you can also go back to them with an email and say like, hey, I know you said this, but, um, and I and I see why you would think this um, and acknowledging and, and, and see, um, but have you thought about it this way? And, and, and changing the narrative also can help. Yeah, and no, I just I just love what you just said. It speaks too much to me. I feel like the first step is um, again. I don't. I feel like we talked a lot about our father. It seems that we were very lucky in this regard. <laughs> My father is one of the greatest salespeople uh, the world has never heard about. I <laughs> <laughs> and he would use to. He he was a very strange teacher. Almost like he he would give me these super unethical quests and challenges and homework assignments to teach me something in a way and since he's oh, a former cool. soldier from like he didn't really give a shit about like what the west thought of his educational methods in a way so one of the things he did with me he was he sat me down i was like 12 years old or something like this you know, insult me <laughs> <laughs> insult you insult me in the worst possible way he's possible he said Diane, your job is to stay controlled in a way he would insult my mother my sister i'm a weakling whatever kind of shit and i and he just waited until I would burst and or start crying in a way and then we would do it again and I have to survive pretty much 30 minutes straight until that the little uh, harassment of him was over and wow. that taught me that the very first stage of objection handling is actually emotional discipline in a way mm. you can't take it personally if somebody in front of you says no the moment you get reactive and you get mad at a person you lose them in a way perfect perfect the, the second thing I, I feel like we have a commonality is acknowledging in a way it's like the second thing i learned about objection handling is listening like a therapist a therapist listens like that you do not interrupt the person until they're finished speaking then you summarize the gist of what they try to convey to you, give it back to them in a way acknowledge them and say so right now it's not a good time i understand it in a way and then you use a strategical question that is either open-ended in the end to keep a conversation going and that's like the commonalities that I found here in a way. Is, is, does this uh, concur with what you found as well? Per perfect. And I, and I think then, then I also missed a few things is um, listening, deep listening, actually knowing. So uh, early in your sales career, what happens is that you're, you've got your sales script and you say your intro and they, they go, nah, I don't think this is for me. Yeah. And then you're like, fuck, fuck. And then in your head, you're like, what, what question do I need to ask to keep them on the phone? And so then that's why you need to do the 100 because you slowly get a yeah. bit further in the conversation and yeah. further. Um, listening, deep, you start to become better at deep listening and being able to listen. And I think that way you get to, as you said, you get to summarize their point backwards. So imagine someone says like, oh, um, no, I, 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 I'm too busy at this time of the year to, to, to do this. And you can go back to them and say like, okay, so uh, I, I actually also spoke to other people who are extremely busy. Uh, just like you, I understand you're doing this Oof. and this. But you're spending f how, five hours, something like that, per day on, on your, your job right now. Um, and is, is that right? And so you're just confirming a few key things that can, you can go back to them and you're keeping the conversation going, um, which keeps this... Um, this ability to almost just like show them um, and I've, I bring awareness to how others are also doing it. Yeah. Um, and there's quite a beautiful like, well, oh man, well, they're, they're also, he's right that I'm spending five hours on that so he knows some information. Oh, maybe he has got something. And so there's a little bit of curiosity is, is created. But um, then it comes with like the best questions. I remember there was one girl I met recently. Um, 
actually the day I, I found out I lost everything, I was like, oh, so overwhelmed. And I was like, do you know what? I have nothing, but I need to just go to the spa. I need to sit in a, in a hot and cold bath and just like try and forget about everything. And then I was there in the cold uh, bath and then the hot. And then this one girl was like, hey, how are you doing? Uh, like smiled at me and was like, yeah. And I was like, well, to be honest, not good. Uh, and she was like, oh, no, what, what's up? And so I, I started talking. I talked to her for 40 minutes. And I was like, why is this girl still listening to me? Yeah. And it was like such a powerful awareness that yeah. like she was able to sit down and just like fully yeah. present listening. And I felt so heard. And it was like such a beautiful relationship came out of that. Of that. Yeah. And shout out Candela for that. She um, and, and everyone around her also have identified her as having that because she yeah. listens and then comes up with such deep, interesting questions that makes you realize like she was really listening. Yeah. Um, it's, yeah. it's for people who want to learn how to listen. I, I've had the privilege of learning from uh, one of the things that really gave me a lot of confidence after being mentored by some of the best therapists in the world is that even like FBI negotiators and political diplomats and people who make high stake deals, they all take their techniques from from clinical psychology, actually, in a way. And one of the things that has been useful for me is thinking a lot of, like, when somebody shares it with you, like, I learned this from Carl Rogers, who pioneered active listening, in a way. He was one of the people who came up with this, where it's like, imagine that somebody gives you a painting, and without you starting to criticize this, your first job is to take that painting and describe what you what you see on it, in a way, and then ask them if you got the gist of it and give it give it back to him in a way. Mm. And the people we and we don't like are usually the people who don't even look, who likes people who don't even look what you draw for them in a way. And that was a metaphor that really helped me to understand like the the essence of this. And even on a friendship level, what you just described. My best friends are usually those who, who don't just immediately tell me how my painting is supposed to look like. But they see me and they look me and they make make room for like for, for me in that particular conversation. And it's it's those people that we like. What is the misconception I think is people think that we like those who tell us the sweetest things. That is actually not the case. We are that is one of the things that makes you sound salesy and that makes you feel sound dishonest and makes you yeah, sound it's like inauthentic. It's inauthentic and it feels manipulative in a way. Even if you're super excited and you want to make somebody like you or even love you, it's it's uh, positive conditioning is not the way to go, in a way because it's it, it feels like what are you what are you exactly acknowledging if if you didn't even prove that you're seeing them in a way so then it's just a general thing and then mm. you are anyway okay um, sorry I noted out about thoughts here for a little bit <laughs> what's next for you man tell us a little bit about the state of your current venture your and what the world could potentially do to help you in this. Yeah, very exciting stage. We had been there, have uh, built the application. We have um, got a few thousand people on a wait list who people can go to beanthere.tech, uh, see all about our product and, and sign up and, and start uh, using the product to help connect to, like I said, to someone who is two steps ahead, someone who can guide you. And I see a world where we as a... Well, the more conversations you're having with people who are outside of your direct field can give you insights into how to uh, see the world, how to, things that you just the, the unknown unknowns. Um, someone who's been there can, for example, you might be like, I want to be this advertiser and I want to move to New York. We'll go and speak to someone who is in advertising in New York to be like, I, I hate my life. It sucks. I do 14 hour days and like, I don't see, I don't see daylight and um and i'm pretty miserable to be honest and so like that would be an interesting conversation oh well oh yeah and so through people having more conversations and helping others and seeking that knowledge uh you can have guides from different avenues to to bring in to to help you um then on the flip side of that i see a world where many people and through my um interviews and, and speaking to people I asked the question, I was like, would you, would you like to, to help others? And nine out of 10 people were like, yeah, I would, uh, happily, I would love to help others. Oh, well, are you helping others right now? Are you mentoring? Are you speaking to people? No, two out of 10 people were roughly um, oh, wow. actually, actually speaking to and helping others. So 
there was a disconnect between like people who are um, wanting to help and who are. And I was like, well, what is that key? What is that identification? And so I also found, and this comes into it, is like w the word mentor is quite a scary word for a lot of people because they're like, would you be my mentor, Daniel? He'd be like, well, oh, how, how, how much time do you expect that you need yeah. from me? Like all of these questions kind of pop up as, as a word mentor. Um, and a lot of people have impos imposter syndrome where they maybe in a job or they're uh, in something that they think, well, I don't know if I'm that good. I'm, or a lot of people like, I'm not good enough to be a mentor yet. Like when I'm getting like 40, 50, I'll become a mentor. But actually I want to change that realization in that game to say, well, you've had experiences, you've been there, you've got some wounds. Tell someone who's two steps behind you, who's wanting to do a similar thing to you, go and help them. And the, the beautiful thing in, in some data that came out of, of mentorship as an industry, those who actually mentor and are the mentor actually get more out of the relationship than the mentee hmm. because they solidify their learnings. Uh, the best way to learn is to tell others and to teach others. Yeah. And so you are validating what you know. You can now uh, share your experiences. Others, then the mentee goes away and they go and try, try your, your, your lessons that you learned and your experiences. You can now validate if it's still valid and still working. So you do that. You can also then feel good because you're actually helping someone else achieve their goals and yeah. feel good about that, which is awesome. And then thirdly, on being there, you can actually get paid for your time. And so on being there, we... Um, allow people to get paid for the time, upfront payments that encourages people who previously would never have got into uh, mentorship and got into this like, I don't know if I'm ready to be. Now they will receive a message. And the, the key um, differentiator for us is that we are connecting to social platforms. So starting with LinkedIn, now you're often checking your, your LinkedIn messages. You will see that message from an individual and you're like, oh, wow, Daniel's deposited $200 upfront to speak with me about a certain topic that I know about and I've had experience in. Click the link and, and see uh, what he's talking about. I click the link. And in two clicks, I can now mm. have a call booked and be about to help someone and, and jump on that call, help someone and get paid instantly after. Like, wow, I didn't have to sign up to a mentoring site. I didn't need to be involved. I didn't need to do any of that. I just simply had to open a message that I'm already checking my messages, click a link, and now I'm getting paid and I feel great because I've helped someone. So that's how we're changing the game in, in, in being there. Yeah. And at a very exciting stage, and we're, we're looking now, we're at the next round of funding. Um, we've got some huge thought leaders on board as well, some, some celebrities and people who have hundreds of thousands of LinkedIn followers. And the product itself allows people to build a self-brand. A lot of individuals now, and what I see in the future is that we hold a lot of experience and if we can help others, that'd be great. But I want to also live a bit more of a flexible life. We like, everyone likes working from home, traveling, these things. So now imagine walking on the beach, knowing that two people from around the world have just booked you. You can be walking your dogs on the beach or wherever you are and helping others and you get paid for your time. Yeah. And now we build this self brand and we build education into that, help people have these conversations, help people have a better conversation, help people realize that they can become a better teacher from just sharing their knowledge, right? Yeah. So the best quality information in the whole world comes from people who have been there. Yeah. Simple as that. Uh, thanks so much for sharing it. And for anybody who just listens, I can highly recommend that you check out this this particular platform. For me, I'm here in Bali with you. <laughs> but the last three days, I was on a motorbicycle with one of my favorite, maybe the favorite person in, in the world. And I was interviewing sofa farmers. And while I was there, I had people sign up to the Behave University, which allowed me to use my knowledge because I've been to a particular places that allows them to help them way. And I think like, Building my own platform, I would have never do it again. It was it cost me over 100k or something like this. And the fact that you build something that transforms a knowledge holder into a knowledge merchant right away is hugely it can liberate people from their jobs, for their country, from a particular relationship because they are now in charge of what they want to do. And I think if somebody doesn't want to build their own platform but it has your help with this, 
I, I think they should do it in a way. And just, if not for money, then because for their appetite to helping others, right? Yeah, and this could be free. And I see this in, in a few use cases where, well, every use case actually, but uh, you're starting a restaurant and you're unsure of a few different things. Well, go and speak to someone who started a restaurant in a different city who's building a, it's the same. So you, it's not direct competition, but it's someone who has actually done something exactly the same yeah. as you. Um, and that's why it, I think it, actually it, this has like potential unicorn experience, uh, unicorn potential, because I feel... Even if there's something like this, I was on this volcano like three days ago in a way, and I I went there to see some blue sulfur fires in a way. I know the but one. I, you know, have you been the one? It's I like haven't been, but I've Mount seen. Asian. It's, yeah, it looks amazing. It's wonderful, and it's it's. I've been there, and I've trusted, for instance, Google Maps on my. But I didn't know that everything takes twice as long uh, to get there because it's fucking Indonesia, right? So it was like I missed it by a bit in a way. I didn't sleep the night in a way. So now, like, if somebody asks me since I've been there, I say, bro, it's like this. You need to go earlier than I did because I missed it in a way, and that's I think like the the beauty of what what you what you're sharing in a way, and I think like this is uh, particularly for the individual stage. This is what humanity is about, like minimizing repetitive errors or um, avoidable errors. Yeah, society overall will benefit if everyone's helping others. You add the human connection and um, side of. Of, of it and society will be in a better place when more people are helping and encouraging each other sometimes you even just need someone to like listen to as, as an entrepreneur you're struggling so much and you talk and you say I've got this problem this problem and, oh man I don't know about this and I feel like giving up and this is not working and like, I'm really pushing here and someone's just listening to you and who's been there and you're like you got this and sometimes you like you got this that encouragement to know like oh they know that i am trying and i'm doing the right things and like i will figure it out gives me more confidence than uh, ever like speaking to yeah. friends and family like you just want to like you know that that person's like he's gonna make it even in this conversation with you it's like you were when i ask you i shared like one of my fears with you it's like yo the big money is coming in i'm gonna fuck it up i say so what Fuck it up faster in a way. It's like 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 run out of things that could go wrong so that you can get to the right thing. I think like this is hmm. the philosophy in those regards is much more important than the actual advice. And if you can get that from mentors who believe in you, like I think that's that's all we can hope for. You called it been there, positioning it on an individual level. I'm with my current venture, Superhuman Studios, we currently work on taking luminaries such as yourself and turning them pretty much into AI avatars in order to enable intergenerational conversations. And one part of my hope is that since we've been here as a generation, can learn from people from the past and not make mistakes again. If this part of the interview would be the only thing that would remain from your sharings, your, your messages and your letters to the world, what kind of, uh, what message would you share to future generations, something like a sea scrolls almost in a way where you left like some warnings or some some things you want to share with them, if this would be the only thing that would remain. That's a good question. I, I think in my life, uh, what has done me well is just doing the right thing. When people are not watching and you throw a piece of chewing gum and it hits the bin and then falls out of the bin and it's not there but going back and picking it up or um, surfing past a piece of trash and just grabbing it and putting it into your pocket um, allows you to know that you are doing good and you f can feel good about that and that encouragement uh, resonates and I see we are we are energy we are balls of energy and we attract other energies that are in a similar vibe and similar um, frequency and by adding this personal this this human touch and doing the right thing I, I believe can help everyone become a better person and if we were all better people I think the better the, the world would be a better place and I think the the future world would be a better place um, so, yeah, it was that's a very optimistic 
way of thinking, but I will see that that is... What is a mistake that we are doing from our generation that you would like them to not make again? And what do you feel as they something, maybe they have lost it in the future, they could pick up from something we are doing right? Um, I think there is a, there's a status game. I was listening to Naval's pod podcast uh, this morning uh, on the way on the drive here, and uh, a lot of people play this status game, and to win at a status, you have to put other people down. And it's, and it's like a hierarchical positioning, for example, say you're in a, a tribe of monkeys, that there is only one leader, and there's a second and there's a, th a third. Well, if you take down the second, or if you attack the second and you take the second position, then you are there. You know your number two. You can't have two number twos. So by playing the status game, you're kind of like always fighting with others and pushing people down and, and scheming to get to this like number one position, waiting for your opportunity. <laughs> So I, I, I think one mistake that we are, oh, and this is politics and everyone gets wrapped up in it, and if, if we could stay out of it uh, more, unfortunately it's going to continue, but I think if people were, did the right thing and were more honest and open and vulnerable, actually that's what we, we all as humans connect to most. And um, I see it sometimes in the US politics and people and candidates now coming in who are a lot more younger they are a bit more open and honest and vulnerable and um, there's something I think there with um, yeah doing the right thing um, can, can massively help hmm. part of the things I'm interested in is using AI for for good and educational purposes if you could resurrect three people from history in order to have a a pint with <laughs> always a pint always a pint who would they be yeah. funnily enough I'm not too much of a historian I um, I guess I've always been quite futuristic in in like how individuals can see the future and for me that was like more exciting I think than like historians and, and people of the past um, um, so I don't know I think people like um, uh, one, one would like Henry, Henry Ford would stand out as someone who obviously understood business in a very unique and different way And I would like to see how he uh, went and approached. Um, What would you ask him? You say, Henry, you've been there. I got this platform. <laughs> I want to have this question. What would you ask him? I think the why. I think it, it, like the why. I'm always curious to see why people do what they do. Um, because you see motivations and seeing individuals' um, motivations um, helps you identify if you are aligned with them and their motivations. And if you are, this is a great question to ask someone who you're seeking knowledge from. It's like, hey, what are your goals? What are your values? And asking a question like that at the start of a, a mentorship call or a a call on being there, you can identify like, is this person actually someone I want to be speaking to? They might say like uh, very uh, different things to what your values are. Um, so that, um, I was also thinking someone like Steve Jobs, I think is, uh, and I uh, listened to his autobiography and thought he um, saw the world um, he was very unique and, and not afraid of being himself. And that also like stands out to me, S and I think he's created the most uh, or the richest company in the whole world, which has been for a considerable amount of years now. And I think he, uh, in his brain and his way of looking at craftsmanship, 
and and build in quality is a very unique way. So I think him as well. What will you ask uh, Steve? If he maybe has a good day? <laughs> I would, would ask him to go for a walk with me. So then at least I would have probably an hour with him. Oh, that's a good idea. Um, the old, good old foot in the door technique. I would ask him stories that have led him to where he has got and some life lessons that he feels that I could take on today and implement into my life to make some positive change. I I think stories are always uh, a great way. But yeah, you first have to... Uh, do you want to go for a beer? Do you want to go for a second beer? Let me show you in a better place across town so you get more time with them. Ah, so that's that's, the, that's a good one. I'm going to yeah, remember yeah. that. Let's go play tennis. You like, you have to uh, increase the, the time with these, yeah. these, these guys. Yeah. Um, and then you, and they will identify that there is a fun relationship that can be built and they will want to hang out with you some more. I love that. <laughs> Last question. And the third one would be oh, third one. the third one would be Aladdin's genie. So then I get lots more wishes, and then I can keep bringing people <laughs> back to life. <laughs> oh, please move him more to me. I have some work for them. <laughs> right now, my genie is Adrian Blackwood. Shout out to you yes. for for building all these fucking amateurs for me. Digital immortality is something I was always passionate about. My father has been my greatest hero, and he. I was always enchanted by the idea that potentially I could save some of his soul for my future son that mm -hmm. so that they can ask him the questions that helped me to become a man. If you would decide at some point to build an avatar of you and that would be installed maybe at your grave, <laughs> what would be... the first um, story that would that particular avatar would tell or what do you think would be a question this avatar would would uh, greet others with who would pilgrim to your to your graving your 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 resting place so to say what would that be like i think um stories as always what resonates with everyone the most so I then asking uh, a story, getting people talking, getting people comfortable with them sharing. I don't know what I would, my avatar would ask people. Um, I recently, I had my parents over in, in Bali and it was um, an incredible moment and a, a way for us to become, like I said earlier in the, in, in the conversation, like become best friends and become friends rather than parent child dynamic but actually become friends where and and laugh and but it also gave me an opportunity to ask and one of the questions i asked over dinner which is one of the best dinners i think i've ever had in my life was some questions to my mom and i was one of them was like how was the first year of having me in your life hmm. and what is the happiest memory of me and you in your whole life and so there was those created stories and I think something uh, around that I think uh, as my avatar of someone coming to me and being like hey tell me a time when the craziest adventure we went on together or what sticks out to you as uh, the funnest moment where we laughed the most hmm. and bringing back those memories I think is a very powerful way to to activate people um yeah. The gist of you would never be encapsulated <laughs> in something like that. I don't think I will get that close. <laughs> you will. If you go to heaven and you meet God there, what do you think, what do you hope he will say to you looking at your life's work and who you were? That you allowed yourself to push and persevere and persist to make the mistakes to help others 
come in and, and, and clear a, a clearer path. So by me, I think it would just be a thank you. A thank you for, um, for God to know that I've gone in my life and done the right thing. Uh, I've followed and been aligned with my truth that has allowed me to make many mistakes and through that others can follow and 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 hopefully like a, a platform like and and I'm building being there right now but I think like, as I said very right at the start like my my dad's motto in life was a stranger as a friend you haven't met yet I just want to go out into the world and allow more people to to connect and have more people if more people connect from different walks of life as we found when we travel you're like oh People are actually way more similar than I thought. And there's a beauty in this human connection that we have. And if people, more people connect from, uh, if I have a, a guy that I speak to in Africa and I speak to someone from China who I also speak to, like I get such a different view that allows me and, and way more connections in the world. And if I can make as many mistakes as possible and God can say thank you because others now can follow in my, my footsteps and, and have a bit more of an idea of things to avoid and essentially just allow the human species to get ahead. And I see a world where we are interplanetary and spaceships flying around and it would kind of suck if we as a human race, we're just like, never got there. And we just didn't try, you know? And I like this is why Elon Musk is pushing the boundaries. He's like, let's not be afraid. Let's not just sit and like, let's let's create like everything autonomous in our lives from cars to planes to, so we can create and, and explore our creativity and, and, and show our creativity. And through that, we can get to other planets and we can like really push the boundaries and like, let's not be like a boring planet like yeah. we're humans like let's fucking go let's let's show the world and if i can encourage more people to have more conversations and more connections we'll create a better um questions and through those questions better um advancements and society improves from that then fuck yeah let's 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 go fuck yeah <laughs> i mean this uh, describes this entire conversation <laughs> adventure with me in a completely concur that everybody should feel called to contribute their own birth to the great song of life and it should be a story of our species no matter when it ends that should not be a boring one in a way. Mm. so let's get out and go after it mm. where can we find you tell people how they can support you how they can connect with you and what's next for you I'm always, I love speaking to people. Like I said, I get my energy from people. So if anyone wants to connect to me, uh, they can email me. Um, Share them, please, your podcast, your business, and your email, and yeah. your socials so that uh, all the people who listen to know what to do. Yeah, you can email me at jamie at beanthere.tech. Uh, J-A-M-I-E. Um, I also have my podcast. It's called Mentor Stories. You can find it on Spotify, YouTube, where we discover in in twenty minute, thirty minute snippets the stories of a mentor, uh, someone who has been a, a guide in an individual's uh, life, where they have maybe gone through a struggle. This individual, and they've said, "Okay, I need to find someone." Maybe they went to their father. Maybe they've went to an, another individual who's passed down some wisdom. And they have then used that and gone into the world and tried it. And so now that is a tried and tested piece of wisdom. And it might have failed, but now that tried and tested wisdom has realized that it failed. And have they changed it? How did they change it and implement it something differently? And how did it finally work? And through that story, and a listener can say, oh, wow, that piece of wisdom still applies. Oh, wow, I can now use that in my life. And in 20-minute snippets, they can listen to that. So it's tried and tested mentor stories uh, through a story that an individual can listen to. So mentor stories on, on Spotify. and and But that's a that's a personal project, a five-year plan of just having more conversations, more more stories out there, more lessons learned that can be listened to and, and implemented by other individuals in, in the world. Um, yeah, been there dot tech. Uh, you can find all of the information. Sign up. Uh, we would love to have you, and and you can use our platform to connect to others. Um, and then you can also um, invest. 
Uh, there's a we are we have opened up our uh, WeFunder campaign, so you can go into WeFunder.com and type in Bean there, um, and you'll find us where you can invest a hundred dollars, two hundred dollars, get involved, uh, be be that um, that part of us that we we really need to uh, hire the best software developers, hire um, great marketers and people who can build relationships, who can get our product out there into the world. And it would be awesome to have you on board. And through that, we, and I'm so open to, I, I'm already creating groups, which um, are for investors who want to be part of the company, co-create, let's co-create this. I don't have all the uh, I, uh, answers I am a human, I have some ideas, there are lots of failures, but uh, having more people involved and who can co-create and help in this uh, product to build this community of people who want to share and help others connect more and build personal brands, then please reach out. We'd love to talk. And um, and if anyone wants to invest, then awesome. It'd be incredible to, to have you and, and be connected. Thank you so much for this conversational adventure. It will take me a while to process it all. <laughs> and I hope to have you on again in the future, Jamie. Thank you so much for showing up today. Thank you. Okay. Pleasure. Cut. <laughs>